Hey, YouTube, Marshall here. Today's episode is one of my favorite realignment topics. I am answering, or at least attempting to answer the question of why have working class Hispanic voters increasingly been voting Republican, despite all the very obvious 2016 to 2020 Trump policies, statements, decisions, everything you could possibly imagine that would suggest the opposite would be true. We're looking at Hispanics in Texas, so not merely Cubans. Really interesting story. We've got a great guest today, Gerardo Cadava, to really go over it. He's written about this topic and studies this at Northwestern University. Hope you enjoy the episode and definitely let me know what you think in the comments. Gerardo Cadava, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you so much for having me, Marshall. Really glad to speak with you. I wanted to do an episode on the topic of Hispanic slash Latino voters forever because it's definitely one that, as the zeitgeist on this issue has changed, has gotten really discombobulated. So I want to center things for folks. When we start with this question, I was reading a book recently for review purposes, and I noticed a slightly funny editing error. In one paragraph, you have the author refer to Latinos, Hispanics, and then Latinx people. And I genuinely <laughs> think what's happened here is that the editor hasn't decided what is yeah. used in what context. So mm -hmm. without any judgments on any terms, can you just actually define what these three terms are? Because your book is the Hispanic Republican, but you've written yeah. pieces at the Atlantic where it's called the Latino vote. So how should mm -hmm. we understand these terms? Yeah. And, and I personally might not be as doctrinaire about these things as other people. So I, I myself am comfortable moving in and out of Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, depending on what audience I'm talking to. So basically, Hispanic is a term that was kind of popularized in the 1970s, maybe early 1980s. That might have been the um, you know most prevalent term at the time. It's often noted that it was a kind of creation of the Nixon administration for the first time and uh, and used for the first time in the 1970s census when Hispanics were referred to as Hispanics. I think in the years since it's come to have a particular political connotation, especially among conservatives, like the earliest um, advocacy groups for Hispanic Republicans. One was called the Republican National Hispanic Assembly. Many Latino conservatives refer to themselves as Hispanics. It's also really regional. Um, New Mexicans still tend to use the term a lot. Puerto Ricans in, on the island of Puerto Rico still tend to use the term a lot. And I do think it uh, connotes a relationship with Spain and the Spanish empire, Hispanic. And so uh, depending on your perspective, that can be either distasteful or something to celebrate. Latino is kind of more Pan Latin American, I guess, and you know the debates among Latinos about where to draw the boundaries around Latinidad. Um, you know, Brazil is a good example. Like, if Latinos are united by the Spanish language, then there's not much room for Brazil. But if Latino refers to Latin American, presumably that would include Brazilians as well. These are the kind of contours of the debate. And Latinx is a much more recent term that is meant to be gender inclusive. You know, Spanish is a language where you can say Latina to refer to women, Latino to refer to men. And so uh, youngsters in general, I can't believe I just said youngsters. I feel like that, that makes me an old man almost. But um, youth students I teach have embraced the term Latinx to be more gender inclusive. In my book, I used um, the Hispanic Republican because that was the preferred term for the characters I was writing about. And what happened to the term Chicano? I've like noticed like when you yeah. read like, I'm thinking back to like my undergrad days, like in academic mm -hmm. books, especially they're referred to Chicano. Like what happened yeah. with that term? It's still around. It's still around. Um, you can find people on Twitter in their handle describing themselves as Chicanos. Uh, I think there's also variations of that. Like some people say, I spell Chicano with an X and it's spelled X-I-C-A-N-O. And that's more of, uh, of an indig indigenous uh, spelling of Chicano. So, and that these two have um, cultural and political meaning, I think. So Chicano is still around. I think it, um, it for sure, it specifically applies to Mexican Americans. And I think the people you would find using it today live primarily in the Southwest. So here's a question then that I think is slightly uncomfortable, but I'll ask it anyways. Mm -hmm. To what degree does the culture war naming controversy 
actually matter when it comes to talking about the phenomenon we're discussing today, which is like the Hispanic, Hispanic, Latino conservatives. So, for example, if you talk about how Republicans are making inroads in Texas, is that because Democrats are out of touch and say Latinx? And when we say Democrats are out of touch, we really mean people in Brooklyn, if we're like honest. About what we're, 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 how much does that debate tend to matter in these actual communities? I think that's a terrific question. Um, I it's hard to pinpoint, you know, I mean, I do think Latinx for those who are inclined to oppose the usage of the term, who do not like the term, I think they lump Latinx in with a whole bunch of other issues like uh, defund the police, abolish ICE. It's just another uh, symbol of the times um, in terms of how the woke left is uh, driving the train off the rails, you know? Um, I think that's what it symbolizes. On the other hand, for the people who use it, I think it really um, is meant to be an inclusive, all-encompassing term. I I remember reading a book by um, Paula Ramos called Finding Latinx. That's a real strong argument for how Latinx is a, an inclusive term, even for those who don't identify as Latinx, it's meant to be inclusive. I think those are the um, kind of contours of the debate. The debate. I, you know, I, I don't personally understand how people can get so fired up about naming preferences. I mean, on the one hand, I feel like today we live in a country where everyone is allowed to define their own identity for themselves. You know, you have the use of gender pronouns in classrooms um, and many other settings. So we're comfortable with this idea that our identities are individually defined. So for me, if someone wants to call themselves Latinx, they should call themselves Latinx. I have no problem with that. I don't think that it's a term that people should impose on other people. But I also don't think it's a term that, you know, someone should get so fired up about that it also defines their sense of politics. I mean, to me, people call themselves what they want to call themselves. I am happy to call someone else the thing that they want to be called. Um, So, you know, that's, that's how I feel about it. I also, I should say, you know, I'm sitting in a particular context as the director of a Latina and Latino studies program at Northwestern University. We are called the Latina and Latino studies program. Our students a few years ago wanted us to change the name of our program to the Latinx studies program. And for various reasons, you know, it's interestingly, the administration hopped on it. They they were excited to use Latinx studies, maybe because it's shorter, it's easier to spell, who knows. But um, faculty were, more ambivalent, not necessarily because they were ideologically opposed, but because if you know anything about Latino naming practices over a long period of time, you know that what's fashionable kind of changes all the Mm -hmm. time. It goes from Spanish speaking to Hispanic, to American of Mexican descent, to Chicano, to Latino and Latino. So if we're changing the name of our program to always keep up with what's current, we're going to be changing the name of our program every five years, you know? So I think this gets another added layer of complexity when you think about publishing and in-house style guides. You know, I, I get emails from newspaper publications all the time that say, you know, can you guide us on what term we should use? And um, I think that, you know, I guess I'll give the advice now to whoever's yeah. listening that I think Latino is safe. I think Hispanic is safe. Um, I myself use Latino and, um, but you know, I'm a 44 year old man and maybe that says more about what generation I come from than anything else. So I think Hispanic and Latino are still pretty safe. Yeah. Last one on this note, before we get to a couple other topics, what I wonder about when you're talking about your students, um, so you know, mm-hmm. younger students are interested in you know changing names, those different bits. I wonder about how like class plays into that, um, mm-hmm. in the sense that you know Northwestern, it's an excellent school. I've lived with a bunch of my roommates went to Northwestern. Um, could entirely vouch on on, on y'all's programs, obviously, aside from. Mm-hmm. Uh, rankings and everything, but you know that's a specific portion of like the like Latino population that is going to a place like Northwestern that is going to work at those newspapers that is going at those places. 
New York Times, Style Guides, all those different bits. So how should we think about how a community uses terms when who gets to set the rules of what terms are used, especially in today's culturally polarized America, are clearly not, it's, this clearly isn't democratic. Whether it's right or wrong, this is not like a democratic process. Mm -hmm. I, I might need to know a little bit more about what you mean, but let me try to answer it. And then if I'm kind of going off track, you can you can yeah. uh, bring me back. But you know, I would. I think that a, a place. I think it's really. It's a really interesting question. You know, what the kind of class dynamic and social class and you know educational background is of people who use uh, Latinx or Latino or Hispanic. Like I, I, I said already that you know a term like Hispanic tends to be used regionally as well in a place like New Mexico. So even places um, like Northwestern. I mean, Latino students from New Mexico might come to Northwestern thinking of themselves as Hispanic and are only confronted with the term Latina or Latino or Latinx for the first time when they come to Northwestern, regardless of what their political background is or what their um, national background is. But I, I also don't know um, if, you know, there's a higher prevalence of the use of a word like Latinx in a place like Los Angeles or Chicago than a place like Florida, where, you know, there are also students at Northwestern, many of the students I meet at Northwestern who are from Miami, for example, are Latinas who went to a school in Miami called the Carrollton School of the Sacred Heart, which is almost entirely Latino and Latin American. Many Latin Americans send their children to the Carrollton School of the Sacred Heart. And I don't, I, I've never heard them call themselves Latinx. But the other thing that happens, I think, when you get to college is that, you know, you meet people from places that are not the place that you came from, and you kind of develop your own new ideas about identity and your relationship to a community. So it would be an interesting thing to study to see how um, people's self-identification and naming practices change once they go to college. I mean, I myself, I, you know, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona and California. I'm the product of a, you know, white, mother and a Latino father. And by Latino father, I mean like Colombian, Panamanian, Filipino, Mexican. And um, I don't, you know, in the 70s and 80s, I never called myself a Latino. I just don't think that term was in circulation as much. Then we moved to Princeton, New Jersey. I don't even know what I called myself then. <laughs> but, you know, the first time I started calling myself Latino maybe was in college. So identity is complicated, man. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. I feel like it it changes individual people can have, uh, you know, different senses of themselves in one context versus another. And in general, I think my general principle is to kind of um, let people identify themselves the way that they want to be identified and don't expect that there's going to be consistency and people might refer to themselves in different ways in different contexts at different moments in their lives. That becomes hard, of course, when you know, you're like a political candidate like Elizabeth Warren and your aides are telling you to use the term Latinx and you think you're doing the right thing because you're following your uh, campaign advisor's advice, but you don't, you're walking into a thicket that you don't quite understand, you know? Yeah. Let me, you actually mostly answered it, but I want to give a little bit more succinct version of it. Basically what I'm curious about is um, young Latino students who go to a school like Northwestern are likely, mm -hmm. not always going to be, are likely to be professional. You're going to go to law school, you're going to med school, all those, all those different bits. You are demographically different than a Hispanic or Latino kid who is from LA and doesn't go on to college. Mm -hmm. When you were referring earlier to the Latinx question, you're like, oh, maybe I'm just like an old guy at 44. Mm -hmm. Well, I would guess there'd probably be a difference in Latinx usage based on whether or not you're going to college or not going to college is basically what I was yeah. getting at. And then I'm just sort of, in, I'm, I'm broadly interested in the topic of like, how do you have conversations about race in institutions when only mm -hmm. certain demographic or ideological aspects of any one group are like represented. So for example, you know, there's been lots of reporting about how the Biden campaign had this difficulty because you had like young black staffers who thought one View, who had one view on questions like race and policing, all those different bits, those positions didn't quite track with, let's say, the broad opinion of like 
the black majority in this country. Um, that's not to say any one side is right on these questions, but it's like a really fascinating dynamic that I don't think anyone's really thought about because I think we're in this weird position where we want to make race of everything about race and everything kind of is always about race, but there also are class and demographic dynamics that fit into that. And America has yeah. always been awkward about that. Yeah, I think you're hundred percent right. I'm not exactly sure how that uh, maps on to the question of Latinx as a term that gets used. Um, it sounds like, I, and I don't know the answer to this, but it sounds like your assumption might be that uh, college educated Latinos or college students who are Latino would be more likely to use Latinx than say someone who doesn't go to college. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I th- yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, that, that might be right. I'm not sure. But I also think that um, just because it, just if a student doesn't go to a university like Northwestern, it doesn't mean that they don't necessarily go to college either. And I and this is where mm-hmm. I think this is where I think the regional and local variations come into play, because if you're a student, for example, from Los Angeles who goes to Cal State L.A., I mean, the, the programs out there are still called Chicano studies programs or Mexican-American studies programs. They're not even called Latino studies programs. UCLA recently changed its name to. I can't remember if it used to be called the Chicano Studies Research Center. I don't know if they moved to Latino Studies, but they all certainly incorporated the name Central American Studies into their name because that's the local population they're serving. I mean, there's a huge that's population interesting. of Central yeah. Americans in LA. So then, you know, and in, in New York at Hunter College, it's still called the Puerto Rican Studies Program. So it all of these things have very local uh, and regional variations. I mean, I think a place like Northwestern more even what the name Latino signals at a place like Northwestern has less to do with, um, you know, the kind of school that Northwestern is than it does the region where it's located. I mean, Chicago's Latino population is incredibly diverse. It's Mm -hmm. Mexican American, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Ecuadorian, Guatemalan. And I do think that, you know, the, the broader the group of Latinos you're talking about, the more likely they would be to come together around a term like Latino. That's fascinating. Everything from Central America to Puerto yeah. Rican studies. So yeah, let's get to the let's get to the 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 meaty question, which I'm sure people are looking for in the title here. Um, this is the worst pivot I've ever made in my life, but I'll keep going with it. <laughs> keep um, going. Yeah, yeah. We so can do it. 20, and this is what I was referencing at the start of the episode when I said there's been a lot of like conventional wisdom. It's like yeah. really rapidly shifting around like how Latino voters are actually thinking, despite mm-hmm. everything from 2015 yeah. to 2020. According to some polls, Trump, you know, increased his percentage of the Hispanic vote um, by ten points. Mm-hmm. On the face of it, that seems counterintuitive and crazy. What's happening? Uh, there's so much to say, and um, you know, I've been talking about this now for two years, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. I think there's a lot. I am increasingly confident in saying, and there are still questions I have. I mean, the biggest lingering question is what it means for the future. I mean, we know what happened in 2020, and I do think analysts, even those who are the kind of democratic advocates and political party consultants, are increasingly comfortable saying that there has been a shift, that something changed between 2016 and 2020. Even that point was not readily admitted the day after the election on 2020. Mm-hmm. You know, the emphasis was on how Latinos actually helped Joe Biden win the White House by delivering states like Arizona for the first time in a long time. So that was the narrative by um, Democratic strategists, political consultants, pollsters, right out of the election. And there was a lot of um, doubt cast over whether the shift was real, whether it actually happened, what we were seeing. I do think we are increasingly comfortable saying that a shift did happen. It is real. The, The movement is real. And frankly, I mean, every kind of opinion poll taken since the election confirms that there's something going on. And, you know, I think a lot of people have also looked to things like the um, special election in Virginia and um, New Jersey and Gavin Newsom's recall in California as kind of signs since 2020 about, you know, what's going on among Latinos. And um, so the shift is real. And I'll, I'll just start there. But About the Trump presidency from 2016 to 2020, I think, you know, watching how Trump 
approached Latinos is kind of like watching television on a split screen because you do have all of the public pronouncements about Mexican rapists, murderers, and thieves that make it sound like that, that those are the kinds of statements that make it seem like it's unimaginable that Latinos would support Trump. And those were the real public pronouncements. There was also the um, you know, incident in the Rose Garden at the White House where the CEO of Goya Beans uh, praised Trump and then got slammed for uh, praising Trump and saying that we were lucky to have Donald Trump as president. But I think to take that as an example, something the media missed that is really important to Latinos is that what that whole event at the White House was about was support for charter schools, support for um, small business owners and giving them loans. So the media got obsessed with this Goya bean story and totally missed what the event was actually about, which was the announcement of support for charter schools, religious liberty, and um, small business owners. And I think that's indicative, the fact that you know the media got obsessed with one thing, even though the event was about something else, that's indicative of this split screen reality, because at the same time that Trump was making all these public pronouncements about rapists, murderers, and thieves, from the day he set foot in office, he or Mike Pence were giving speeches before Latino business communities, talking about slashing financial regulations, cutting taxes, making it easier to get small business loans, his support for um, charter schools with religious identities. He also was a kind of frequent guest at evangelical churches um, with a lot of Latinos in Florida or Arizona. And, you know, I think the Trump administration knew that Trump himself wasn't necessarily the best messenger to deliver, uh, you know, messages about morality and uh, church going and faith and things like that. So Mike Pence and even Mike Pence's relatives, I can't remember his name, but he had a nephew who um, was really active in the Latino outreach um operation because he had spent time in Latin America, New Spanish, things like that. So the point is there was the split screen with the public pronouncements, but then all of the kind of on the ground things the Trump campaign and his Latino surrogates were doing for his whole four years in office to really reach out to Latinos. And you shouldn't forget that, like, I think it was in 2015 or 2016, at the same time that Trump said, I think in Detroit, that he was going to win the African-American vote, he also said that he was going to win the Latino vote in 2015. So even before he became an, a, can a candidate officially, or maybe right after he became a candidate, he believed that he was going to win the Latino vote. And so that's what he set out to do. I think something that's interesting here is that in terms of like discourse, especially with with outsiders, you tend to lump Hispanic voters in with Black voters, with Asian voters, and something you just point out, um, you know, right off the bat, you know, with your writing, especially the Hispanic Republican, is that like a fourth to a quarter, sorry, uh, yeah, a, a, quarter a quarter to a third, to yeah. a third <laughs> yeah. of uh, you know, his, uh, Hispanics have voted Republican since like you know seventies. Uh -huh. um, that's obviously very different than the black community. So can you mm -hmm. kind of, you know, obviously like you're not, you're not studying, you know, black people, but could you basically talk about how, yeah. how a, a, a person of color, like voting experience has been like wrapped together when actually there's very clear, if you look at these numbers, it's very different. Totally. And what was really interesting to me to learn as a historian is that these two things were happening at the exact same time, the declining support for the Republican party by African-Americans was going down at the same time that support for Republicans was going up among Latinos and for intertwined reasons. Um, and a lot of it stemmed from the 1964 presidential campaign when Barry Goldwater very famously took a stand against the Civil Rights Act. And even though African Americans since the Civil War and Reconstruction era were strongly identified as Republicans, as soon as Barry Goldwater, I mean, the, the support for Republicans had been going down a little bit ever since the New Deal, because many African Americans also supported Franklin Roosevelt for all of the New Deal programs, putting food on the table, giving them jobs, those sorts of things. So that's when the Democratic Party started to break into the African-American community and start winning African-American, greater numbers of African-American support. But many African-Americans remained Republicans into the 1960s until Barry Goldwater didn't support civil rights. And that, you know, ever since then, that was when like 
Goldwater and Nixon embraced what's known as the Southern strategy to try to like, you know, appeal to Dixiecrats to flip white Democrats in the South to become Republicans. And that came at a cost for the Republican Party, which was losing African-American support. So at the same time, I mean, Nixon's campaign strategists in 68 are very explicit about this. They say, we are losing African-American votes. We need to make up for that lost support from somewhere. And the prime targets, one of the prime targets was Latinos. And they came up with all sorts of rationale for why this was the case. I mean, they talked about how they needed to note that the Democratic Party supported African-Americans, and that was the party for African-American civil rights, whereas we support Latinos. And we believe that Latinos are kind of naturally conservative because they are anti-communist, they are religious, they have a strong work ethic, all of these things. But it's only in the late 1960s, early 1970s, when they're losing African-American support that they begin to try to articulate these reasons for why it makes sense to go recruit Latinos. Um, the other thing I'll say really quickly is that the, the Latino population is really growing quickly in the 1960s and 1970s. So I think both parties realize that they need to start reaching out to these new voters, especially as states like Florida, Texas, California become more important electorally. And those also happen to be the states with the largest numbers of Latinos living in them. So I think that's what explains it. And in some ways, you know, the fates of African Americans and Latinos has been pretty closely um, linked over the past 50 or 60 years in different ways. I don't mean, you know, there is one argument for solidarity and working in unison with one another because you're both kind of similarly uh, discriminated against minor minoritized voting populations. So there's that kind of argument for solidarity. But as we saw after the George Floyd murder, you know, there were Puerto Rican store owners in Chicago beating up African Americans because they were maybe looters and were going to damage their business, you know, so there's been a lot of uh, a strong history of conflict between African Americans and Latinos as well. And we're still kind of waiting to see where that story goes. I want to make reference to the future point you made earlier. I'm wondering is there a world where towards the end of this 21st century, we think of Hispanic Latino voters more like we think of Italians today um, mm -hmm. in the sense yeah. that, you know, you read any book about early 20th century America, even watch The Godfather, right? So that's mid 20th century. Italian Americans mm -hmm. are not white, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes for, you know, Eastern Europeans, Jews, et cetera. Um, is there a world where America never becomes majority minority because Hispanics just over time by third, fourth, fifth generation are just thought of as white or self-conceptualize themselves as white? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think it's possible that over time, Latinos will increasingly identify as American and will assimilate, but I don't know that it means that they will increasingly identify as white. And I understand, I've heard this idea a lot that, you know, Latinos are really just the next Germans, Italians, Irish. And I think what's meant by that is that European ethnic groups identified as ethnic Americans in the late 19th, early 20th century when they arrived. They were German Americans, Irish Americans, Italian Americans. They experienced discrimination in similar ways. They weren't necessarily seen as white. And then over the course of the 20th century, they became white. They became assimilated Americans. So I understand the reason for the comparison. The thing I don't like is that I wouldn't want to imply that Latino assimilation necessarily means assimilating as white. I think that Latinos are too internally diverse for that. I mean, there are Afro-Cubans, Afro-Puerto Ricans, Afro-Dominicanos, Afro-Mexicans, Afro who when they move to the United States are they negotiate their racial identity somewhere between Latino and African-Americans. I mean, there's a famous case of uh, oh boy, what's it called? In the early 20th century, the founder of the largest collection of African American materials at the New York Public Library. Uh, oh man, I can't remember his name, but he was an Afro Puerto Rican whose name was very much um, 
you know, a, a Latino name, but he changed his name to identify more with New York's mm. African American community. And so I think let Afro Latinos, for example, come to the United States and kind of negotiate their identity as somewhere between Latinidad and African American. And then there are indigenous Mexicans who speak Zapotec and move to Oregon or the Pacific Northwest. So I don't know that they will ever identify as white and assimilate as whites. But I do think, you know, do they do all of them come to the United States with some hope and expectation that they can live a better life here than they did in their home countries, that this will be the country that gives them educational and economic opportunities? And therefore, will they buy into some version of Americanness? And will they be proud and loyal Americans. I mean, I can see that happening. I just don't know that that will mean thinking of themselves as whites in the same way that German, Irish, and Italians did. You know, it's funny, as you're giving that answer, I realized that the flaw in the question is even me just referring to Germans, Greeks, Italians, because those that's a specific country group. And yeah. with, you yeah. know, with, you know, Jewish Americans, like that is a very specific... <laughs> Sorry, we can slip that over. My dog is going. No, no, no hey, worries. Lulu. You know what? I just realized I forgot the dog walker is coming over to pick her up. So no worries. That's why she was barking. Maybe we can uh, start that over. In the meantime, I was um, looking it up. I couldn't believe that I, oh, Schomburg. Yeah, that's that was the, we're still recording, right? So I can, yeah, I yeah, can yeah. get that out. It was the Schomburg uh, Center for African American History or Center, Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And the man's name was Arturo Schomburg, and he changed his name to Arthur Schomburg and stopped identifying with New York's kind of Afro-Puerto Rican community to, well, I don't know about stopped, but identified less as an Afro-Puerto Rican and more as an African American in New York over time. So it's complicated. Yeah. And I think this gets to the flaw in the question, which is that where I'm referring to German Americans and Italian Americans and Irish Americans, when that's not what's happening with Hispanics or Latinos. The, yeah. the better way to phrase the question would be, is there a world where Cuban Americans ever start conceiving themselves as white? Mm -hmm. Are Puerto Rican Americans always going to like that? That's more adjacent. And even mm -hmm. that is just so different. And I think the other thing that comes to mind, I want to know what you think about this, is the difference between Italian Americans and other groups I listed is that with the exception of the German Americans towards like the you know mid 19th century, Hispanics and Latinos actually will be the majority in a mm -hmm. variety of places. So it won't be about defining yourself again. The reason why you would assimilate white is because white is the majority. When you say American, that means white. Right. So by definition, right. that's how you assimilate. But if you're talking about Texas or California, mm -hmm. how is that basically playing out today now? That's right. That's right. And I think, I think um, part of what your question gets at is that in a fundamental way, I think what it means to assimilate into the United States in the early 20th century means something very different than what it means to assimilate into the United States in the mid 21st century, because it's a very, it's a very different country. You know, many Latinos, I mean, Latinos are still legally defined as white, you know, the, ever since the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, which granted Mexican Americans citizenship, Mexican Americans have been legally categorized as white, because in 1848, when Mexican Americans were offered citizenship, the only people who could be citizens of the United States, according to the 1790 Naturalization Act, were white people. And so it conferred legal whiteness on them. Now, historians, legal scholars, sociologists have always argued that, yes, they might have been legally white, but they were always treated as non-white people. And interestingly, you know, there have been court cases throughout the 20th century where Mexican Americans themselves have asserted identities other than white because in California, for example, there were anti-miscegenation laws saying that a black person could not marry a white person. Well, there was a woman named, um, oh, I can't remember her first name, but Perez, who wanted to marry an African-American man. She was not allowed to marry that African-American man. So she went to court to say that she is not a white person as a Mexican-American because she wanted to marry this person. And if it was a non-white Mexican marrying an African-American, that was legal. But if it was a white person marrying an African-American, it was illegal. So the, the whiteness of Latinos is a really contested topic as well. There have, of course, always been Latinos who identify 
as white. Um, so that that probably won't change. You know, the people, the Latinos who identify as white uh, today will continue to identify as white, I'm sure. But I'm not sure that Latinos broadly will come to think of themselves as white. I do think it's quite possible that Latinos will come to identify more and more as Americans, though. Going back to the Trump thing, something I'm wondering about, like when you're talking about this Trump story, you're talking about charter schools, small business, small business, entrepreneurship, right? Like the American dream stuff. Mm-hmm. Like that's been pretty consistent, like Jack Kemp style, like Republican rhetoric, right? You could find a, yeah. a, char- a vouchers packet from like the 1990s. They'd probably say similar things. Mm. Yeah. The question is like, why now? Mm. Right? Why, 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 what's happening now? That is super interesting. And it, it notes really important changes within the Republican Party. And as a, as a historian, it, it's so interesting to me that it is since the 1970s that between a quarter and a third of Latinos have supported the Republican Party. And that has stayed fairly consistent across those 70 years. Sometimes it's a little less, maybe it was around 20% that supported Gerald Ford and Bob Dole. Sometimes it's a little more like with George W. Bush getting 40, 44% of the Latino vote. So, but it's been pretty consistent within that 25 to 33% range, even as the Republican Party has shifted dramatically. I mean, it is no longer, uh, you know, Gerald Ford's party, George W. Bush's party, George H. W. Bush's party. Um, And that's why when I talk to Latino conservatives, I mean, one one simple answer to your question is that Latino conservatives have moved along with the party, you know, okay. um, and and em- embraced Republican par- party policies, no matter what those policies are. I think about my grandpa, you know, my grandpa first became a Republican in 1980. He voted for Ronald Reagan for the first time. He was a copper miner in Arizona, and he voted for Reagan because he said that Reagan was going to put more money into his paycheck in the form of tax cuts. So it was that very particular issue, but he's still alive. He's 96, living in a VA home in Tucson. And he didn't vote in 2020, but he did vote for Trump in 2016. And when I've talked to him about why he supported Donald Trump, he said, uh, Donald Trump is a good guy because he's a Republican. It wasn't any statement about his support for Trump's policies or anything. It was just because he was a Republican. So many Latino Republicans, I think, have just moved with the party. That said, when I was doing all of my interviews for my book, it was actually the older Latino Republicans were having trouble justifying their continued support for Trump's Republican Party. These were Latinos who came into the Republican Party even during the Eisenhower years or the Nixon years or the Reagan years, and just felt like the Republican Party that they entered was no longer the Republican Party that existed today. So there's a guy named Lionel Sosa, an uh, advertising executive in San Antonio who worked on Reagan's Hispanic campaign. Before that, he worked on John Tower, the Texas Senator John Tower's uh, Senate campaign. And he very publicly in 2016, like wrote op-eds in the San Antonio Express News saying, I'm out, I can't do it anymore. You know, this Donald Trump is not a conservative. He's a showman, he's uh, all of these other things, but he's not a conservative. So he announced publicly that he was gonna vote for Hillary Clinton. First time he voted for a Democrat in 60, 70 years. But Trump's percentage of support still went up, which to me signals that he not only consolidated support among many Latino conservatives who felt like they didn't have anywhere else to go. Even if their party was changing, they were still going to vote for Republicans because that's how they'd voted their whole lives. But I think he also had to have energized a whole new group of Latino Mm -hmm. voters, first time voters, youth voters, uh, voters in college. And so I think about there's a guy in Texas, for example, named um, Abraham Enriquez, who started a group called Bienvenido US. It's affiliated with Charlie Kirk's Turning Point USA. He runs his own podcast. He's like 24, 25, a real Texan conservative. And he's a young guy. And his mission is to recruit Latino youth to the Republican Party. So, you know, Trump galvanized a lot of younger Latinos as well. So that's, I think, part of how things are changing. To what degree is this then about Trump and his specific 
working class cross racial appeal versus mm-hmm. just like the Republican Party, right? So like I can't see us having this same conversation if Mitt Romney were president or Mitt Romney had run in 2016. So like the real question here then is like, whenever Trump does leave the stage, yeah. will whoever inherits the Republican Party bring these same potential avenues or is this really just dated to Trump's ability to stand above everything in the American political system for good or for ill? You know, this is a million dollar question. I, I, I feel like with inflation, it's probably a billion dollar question, you know, <laughs> um, because I feel like we've been debating for many, many years whether whether Trump is driving the train or whether there were kind of subterranean political shifts happening in the 80s, 90s and 2000s that led to Trump. I mean, one explanation could be demographic change. The color of the United States has been changing for 40, 50 years. We thought with Barack Obama's election that that represented the kind of ultimate victory of the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s, that we could elect our first black president. And I think that that gave a lot of liberals uh, comfort that they had won, you know. But all along, bubbling under the surface, there was white grievance politics all the time. There was a raid in Ruby Ridge or a raid in Waco that was about about separatism in some ways, but was it was about libertarianism in some ways, but it was also about whiteness. There was like the Ku Klux Klan patrolling the US-Mexico border to halt Mexican immigration in the late 1970s, early 1980s. This is what David Duke was up to in the late 70s and early 80s. So there was like Trumpism before Trump. And this is why like uh, Patrick Buchanan, for example, waged a very successful primary campaign against George H.W. Bush in 1992. He tapped into a lot of the nativism and xenophobia and things like that. So, you know, I think we're really debating whether Trump was driving the train with all these political changes or whether he was just tapping into um, a a broader dissatisfaction that erupted in 2016. I do think that now that the genie's out of the bottle, it's going to be harder to put it back in. You know, I mean, I don't think Trumpism will go away. I think you see a lot of Trumpism in the Latina candidates running for Congress in South Texas right now with Myra Flores and Monica de la Cruz and Cassie Garcia. I mean, a lot of people have talked about how they are saying the same things as Donald Trump and supporting Donald Trump's policies on immigration and everything else. But Uh, are very different messengers than Donald Trump. And so, you know, it's a, it's a weird moment. I mean, this is called the, the realignment, this podcast. And I think we're in the the middle of something happening, but I don't know how the story is going to end. You know, I really don't because, you know, we'll see if um, uh, like, it seems like Trump's endorsement, the role that Trump is playing in, national politics right now ahead of the midterms, it's kind of mixed. I mean, a lot of his primary candidates are winning, but they might lose the general, you know? So so we'll see. What's weird to me here is, and once again, this really comes down to like when you were, you know, when you graduate from college, because I was interning um, on the Hill in 2013, so right after the Romney loss. And yeah. at the time- That was when President Obama was giving his last push for immigration reform. And you had a whole section of the Republican Party that would surprise people today. Sean Mm -hmm. Hannity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, saying we need to support immigration reform because the only way the Republican Party can survive is if we appeal to Hispanic voters more. And the way to appeal to Hispanic voters more is by pathway to citizenship amnesty, pick your euphemism, body, 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 blah. And that gets, that's a whole other set of controversies. But it seems Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. Republicans have started to find their way through. How should we think about the role that immigration plays on the issue ranking? That's that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the quick, the quick thing here too is, and this is why George W. Bush getting to 40% is so important. You don't need to win Hispanics outright, but a Republican party that could consistently get 40% of Hispanics in a variety of states, it's over for Democrats electorally. So help me understand that. Yeah, I think Democrats feel that too. I mean, the number I hear them throw out is like 
you know, they've got to keep winning at least two thirds of the Latino vote if they get closer that's, to that's 60. Pretty that's pretty tight. That's that's it's not... pretty tight. Yeah, it's pretty tight. But, but they think that if they get closer to a 60 40 split, it's a real a real problem. Um, you know, what's really interesting? I mean, you, you're identifying so many interesting things. One thing that is fascinating to me is how quickly the Republican Party turned between 2012 and 2016. I mean, it felt like it turned on a dime, like where, yeah, you have the post the election postmortem in 2013, one year calling for like a big tent Republican Party in 2012. And then four years later, you have a Republican Party that's all about, you know, white grievance and xenophobia, at least in terms of, you know, its candidate. I'm not trying to paint the with a, the same brush, the whole Republican Party. It's as internally diverse and complicated as, as Republicans, as Democrats, I'm sure. But there's no doubt that the primary voters kind of threw their lot in with Donald Trump. And what's well, fascinating quick, to one me- quick, One yeah. quick thing that relates to this, and this is fascinating uh-huh. too, which is 2012, don't forget, Mitt Romney, self-deportation. Yes. And, and yeah. Rick Perry, who seemed like he was in great position, is partially torpedoed over him defending in-state tuition yeah. for undocumented immigrants. So even yeah. that's a case where you had the, the, the big thing, I think, of this conversation is there are these weird things bubbling. Mm. And I think Very even much. that, yeah. even those two incidents really shows you that the 2013 consensus was not a sustainable consensus. But sorry, go on. No, 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 it wasn't. And you also had, you know, John McCain running for president in 2008, but then running for Senate again in 2010, running campaigns to say, like, build the dang fence. You know, he he was all about building about a border that. wall Jeez. in 2010. But you had Herman Cain calling for an electric fence, <laughs> an electric <laughs> an, an electric fence and alligator moats and stuff like that. I mean, another thing that's going on that is hard to forget is uh, 9-11 happens and it's really before 9-11, I mean, I, I've had the chance to meet with Vicente Fox, the former Mexican president. He's told me that the week before 9-11, he was at the White House working with George W. Bush on a comprehensive immigration package. They really wanted to get it done. Bush entered office months before with that as a priority. But the conversation changed after 9-11 in, in lots of ways. I mean, that's when in 2006, there was a Secure Fence Act. Part of the Secure Fence Act was, you know, there's this widespread fear of Muslim terrorists crossing the U.S.-Mexico border carrying missiles. Uh, I don't know that there was any proof or evidence for that, but that was a fear. And so very quickly, like anti-immigrant sentiment swept across the nation. So I think you know, that also helps explain why the Republican Party was like wrestling with immigration at that moment and trying to strike a balance, even, you know, even if they haven't done so successfully between border control and restriction and, um, you know, pro-immigration sentiment. So, you know, what's interesting is I talked to Latino conservatives today. These are people who worked in George W. Bush's White House. They, they, were all about comprehensive immigration reform. Some of them opposed Trump in 2016. They have since come to support Trump. And what some of them have told me is now they're comfortable saying that what Trump showed is that you, the Republican path to victory with Latino support doesn't necessarily run through immigration reform. Mm -hmm. They even say that the George W. Bush theory of the case that you had to do comprehensive immigration was uh, kowtowing to Democrats. And it was basically embracing the Democratic theory of the case. It was like Republican light is what they called it. It was like Republicans trying to behave like Democrats. And what they like about Trump is that he embraced truly conservative ideologies. And in many ways, you know, despite this guy, Lionel Sosa, saying that Trump isn't a true conservative. Many Latino conservatives have actually compared Trump more to Reagan than to George W. Bush and said that, you know, like Reagan, Trump is a kind of conservative ideologue. He's anti-socialist, pro-business, all of these things. Um, So that's interesting to me that to to think that, A, Trump is kind of going to become the second coming of George W. Bush, you know, the Republican most responsible in the past 30 or 40 years for really bringing Republicans into the party. No one would have thought that he was going to be the second coming of George W. Bush and that Trump would be compared more closely to Ronald Reagan. I mean, that's interesting. There are key differences between Reagan and Trump, of course. I mean, Reagan still passed 
the Immigration Reform and Control Act with amnesty for millions of Mexicans and always said that we don't need a border wall between the United States and Mexico and saw Mexico as a real ally. So there are key differences, but on the um, point of kind of conservative ideology, they're more likely to compare Trump to Reagan than Bush. The thing I want to wrap with is where does this leave Democrats and or comprehensive immigration reform activists? Because this really, that's why I was focusing on the 2013 point, because the 2013 point was you have to do this because we're going to win because the country is going to get browner. Mm -hmm. But now if you're a Republican, you're like, "Eh, actually, we don't. We could talk about socialism. We can talk about small business like stuff. There's definitely going to be a COVID hangover there. Like, where does this leave Democrats? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I also think it's fair to ask where where it leaves Republicans and thinking about their long term future, too, and how they're going to kind of build on let. Latino support in 2020. And kind of, I I mean, my personal belief is that before Republicans get too excited about how they did in 2020, they need to remember that, you know, consistently winning between a quarter and a third of the Latino vote, which is continuing to grow. I don't think that's a recipe for long-term success. I mean, looking Mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40 years into the future, just continually win. Why would you only, why would you be happy with just 25 to 33% of a group that will be increasingly important. So I think Republicans have a lot to work on too. And they, you know, they also have said that, um, you know, Marco Rubio and others have said like, well, you know, the Republican party is becoming a multiracial working class party. That's a good statement. It hasn't been that. And I think the Republican party also has work to do to make that statement a reality. So that's the Republican side. I, I think the Democrats, I mean, I think Democrats, this is my opinion. I am not a pollster. I'm a historian. I'm much more comfortable talking about the past than the present. So this is my, uh, I, I think it's a little more than a hot take, but it's <laughs> not quite like solid quote me on this. But my my opinion is that, and I'm not working in that political world where I'm running a campaign, constantly conducting opinion surveys, but my observation is that I do think the Democratic Party is you know, trying to figure out how to retool a bit because they have been operating largely with this theory that it was about comprehensive immigration reform, bringing in new young people to the party. Latinos are overwhelmingly young and thousands are are become eligible to vote every month. Um, And so a lot of the, a lot of it relied on comprehensive immigration reform. One thing I hear democratic activists and strategists talking about today is how uh, immigration is also an economic issue because it's about jobs. It's also a healthcare issue because it's about getting health care for them. It's also about education because it's about schooling for their kids. And so I think they're still thinking a lot about immigration, but trying to make the argument that immigration is also much broader than just immigration because it touches on all of these other aspects of American life. But I also think that the Democratic Party does really have to wrestle with how it is going about recruiting the support of workers and working class voters. Um, It is possible, I think. I, I think this because you can look at the Rio Grande Valley and say that, you know, working class voters really did move toward Donald Trump in 2020. And so I think, you know, both in terms of how they talk about it, but also policies, Democrats are, I think, figuring out how to retool and be more representative of working class Americans. That is an excellent place to end it. Gerardo, we'd love for you okay. to just shout out the the book. It's available um, yeah. in our bookshop. Um, can't recommend it enough. Thank you so much, Marshall. It was nice to talk to you and keep in touch.